A reading from Phoenix Precinct, Chapter 2. Torin Van Wivelt woke up to an empty bed. He sighed, running his hand through his short red hair. He and Jack Reesh had been in a relationship for several months now, and Torin had thought that it was deepening. But for the third straight night, Jack had promised he would come sleep in Torin's home after his late-night job, and he didn't. Sighing a second time, he clambered out of bed and splashed some water on his face from the basin. The time chimes had run six, and he needed to get to the castle. As he performed his morning ablutions, he mused on the fact that he very rarely reported for work on time. Indeed, the number of occasions over his eleven years in the Cliffs End Castle Guard in which he made it to the squad room at or before seven could be counted on the fingers of both hands. But he'd been early for his shift each of the last two days, because he couldn't bear to be in his apartment without Jack in it. Not that they actually lived together, and since he'd started his late-night carpentry job, the ritual had been that Jack would arrive sometime in the middle of the night and curl up into Torin's bed with him. Torin would wake up sometime in the morning and just watch Jack sleep. Without a sleeping Jack there to observe, however, Torin didn't want to be in the apartment any more than necessary. Had Jack not promised to come to his home that night, it would have been one thing. It was the dashed expectation that saddened Torin. As he was putting his leather armor on, a knock came at the door. Walking over to the door in his bare feet, he opened it to reveal a blonde-haired girl from the youth squad, one of the many poor and or ne'er-do-well children who ran errands for the castle guard, who smiled up at him. Hiya, Luke Van Wivelt! Torrin smiled down at the girl, whose name he finally recalled through his not-quite-awake-yet haze was Dieth. She had trouble with the word lieutenant, and refused to be so crass as to call him by his given name, so she used the prefix loot for all the detectives. What can I do for you, Dieth? Sergeant Jonas came and said to come get you. He's got a dead body on Boulder Pass. Luke Tresillian's already on her way. Where on Boulder Pass? Torrin asked. Right by the boulder. Hey, did you know why that boulder's there? Smiling indulgently, Torin gave a response that was both the truth and a lie. I have no idea why the boulder is there. I can tell you. See, th there was this great hero from years back named Akal. Big, strong guy he was. And he was here in Cliff's End fighting a dragon, you see. And, and he threw a big rock at him. It, it, it missed, though. And it landed here. And, and, and then the dragon breathed on him and he died. Couldn't nobody move the big rock after that, so it just stayed there. Fascinating. Torin moved back into his apartment and grabbed his money pouch, which was still attached to the belt he hadn't yet put on. Liberating a copper piece from it, same, he tossed it at Dieth. Thank you for that story, and for fetching me. I need to finish getting dressed, but I'll head directly to Boulder Pass. Dieth caught the copper unerringly. Thank you, Loot! After Dieth ran off, Torin finished up, putting on his belt, his boots, and his earth-colored cloak. Both armor and cloak were emblazoned with the Griffin design that indicated that Torin worked out of Griffin Precinct, which was the formal name for the castle that was the city-state's seat of government. The cloak itself symbolized his rank of lieutenant, making him one of the castle guard's detectives charged with solving the more complex crimes committed in the domain, including, sadly, murder. He exited his apartment and worked his way over, first over to Mirko Way, the main thoroughfare of Cliff's End, which went from the castle all the way to the docks, then turning right at Boulder Pass to head toward New Barlin. He arrived at the boulder that gave the thoroughfare its name to find his partner, Danthrus Tresillian, already present, along with several guards wearing armor decorated with a phoenix crest, symbolizing the recently opened phoenix precinct. His tall, half-elf, half-human partner spied his approach, broke into a huge grin, and turned to one of the guards. You owe me a silver, Jared. Shit! Jared shook his head. Thought I had that one! Holding on a hand, palm up, Danther said, Well... Looking guiltily from side to side, Jared quickly said, I ain't got an on me right now, but I'm good for it. Catch me at the chain tonight. If you're not there, I'll find out where you live. Danthrus's tone was only mock threatening, but Jared swallowed nervously nonetheless. Torin's partner could be very intimidating, even when she wasn't trying to be. Raising an eyebrow as he approached Danthrus, Torin asked, Dare I ask what the wager was? That you'd get here before Benin. Throwing up his hands, Jared said to Torin, You're late every damn day, Lieutenant! You couldn't be late today! Chuckling, Torin said, My apologies, Jared. Regarding his partner, he asked, You were obviously very sure I'd beat Benin here if you bet a silver. What I was betting was that Jack would have blown you off again, and you'd once again be out of the house faster than usual. 
Denthris's face, an unfortunate mix of her father's tapered ears, high forehead, and thin lips, and her mother's wide nose, large brown eyes, and sallow cheekbones, grew more serious. It would have been worth losing the silver to be wrong, though. Are you all right? No, but I suspect what will cure my ills is a case to sink my proverbial teeth into. So what do we have? Escalation. Danthris led Torin over to where the body of a human lay bloody and broken. Torian sighed. There have been, what, five assaults on Barlin refugees since Phoenix Precinct opened? Five reported ones, Danthris said bitterly. But this is the first murder. Do we know who this is? Torin asked. Jared said, I've seen him around, but I don't know his name. None of the other guards knew him either. Damn it, Danthris said. He's been here all night. None of you know him? Another guard, Simon, said, I mean, I know his face, but damned if I know where he lives or nothing. Just then, Afrak, a diminutive human guard, came onto the pass from New Barlin. Yo, Salvit, Slaney wants you back at the precinct. Salvit sighed. What Sergeant Shitbrain want this time? With a snort, Afrak said, You think he told me? Then he looked over at the body. Lord and lady, who killed Tushera? Torin exchanged a glance with, Dan with Danthris, then asked, You know this man? Afrak nodded. Yeah, he was gonna used to be a landscaper in Barlin. Got a family over on uh, on Central Way. Migdil be crushed. She's sickly. They can't work. And they got a couple kids. Finally, Danthris muttered. No need to be snotty about it, Tresillian, came a voice from behind Torin. He turned to see a short wizard approach. This was the magical examiner, Benin, on loan from the Board Brotherhood of Wizards to aid the castle guard. The main way he did so was through an inanimate residue spell, or a peelback, which enabled him to determine what happened in a particular location. I wasn't referring to your arrival, Benin, Dathra said, though I'm grateful for it. I'd love a description of the ship brains who killed this man. Then you'll have to leave. Of course, Torin said. He turned to Jared and the other Phoenix precinct guards. Keep a perimeter that will allow Benin to cast the spell and don't let anyone through. The peelback only worked if there were no living beings in the range of the spell besides the caster. We know the drill, Lieutenant. Jared then grinned. It's the rookies of the castle and unicorn you gotta worry about. Indeed. Tori knew that Jared and the others were good at their jobs. He had to remind himself that while the construction of Phoenix Precinct had been done after a major recruiting drive to add to the castle guard's ranks, Phoenix itself had been staffed by veterans. Jared, Afrak, Salvit, and the others were all transfers from Dragon, Goblin, and Mermaid, while the rookies were all assigned to lighter duties in Unicorn or Griffin. Turning to Afrak, Torin said, Please take us to Tushara's residence. You betcha, Lieutenant. Salvit snarled. Guess I'd better go with you, see what Sergeant Shitbrain needs. How long, Danthras asked slowly, have you been referring to Slaney by that nickname, Salvit? Suddenly apprehensive, Salvat said, Oh, oh, no, ma'am, it's it's just a, I, I, I mean, it's, uh, that is to say, Torin was unable to keep, keep himself from giggling. Holding up a hand, Danther says, No, no, it's fine. Slaney's a moron of the highest order. I've met senile trolls that would make better sergeants. I just want to know how long it's been going on and who thought of it. That second part, mostly so I can buy the person in question a drink. Danthras, Torin explained, served with Slaney and Goblin back in the day. And he was an even bigger shit brain then. Danthor said. Afrak made a noise like a bursting pipe. <laughs> that ain't possible. You have my deepest sympathies, Lieutenant, Salvat said. I've only been serving with him a few months, and I'm figuring he's got blackmail material on L Lord Duval or something. No, Torin said. He simply saved the life of Pharaoh Winnet. Son, Danthor added, of Sir and Madam Winnet, the construction ministers. Figures, Afrak muttered. As they walked into New Barlin itself, initially walking on Albin Way, which ran around the periphery of the neighborhood, Torin decided to change the subject as any discussion of Sergeant Rick Slaney tended to sour Danthras's mood. I heard a new Boulder story today. Danthras rolled her eyes. Lord and lady, not again. Torin laughed. What's she on about? Afrak asked. Throwing up her hands, Danthras said, Go ahead and tell him or I will. Grinning widely, Torin said, About two years after I joined the Castle Guard, Danthras and I caught a case at the Boulder. Much like today, it was a dead body left there, though that one was placed there after being murdered elsewhere. I asked why the boulder was there. Danthris told me the story she was told, that it was the cornerstone of the original castle that served as the seat of Cliff's End. Well, that's nonsense, that is, Afrak said. Everyone knows the boulder was put there by Helsic Gam when he banished the Dragon Riders. Salvet looked at his colleague with irritation. The Dragon Riders are the ones who banished Helsic Gam, not the other way around. 
Anyhow, that's not the truth. The boulder's really all that's left of the great beast Matahook after he was turned to stone by Huang. And now you see my joy, Thorin said enthusiastically. And my agony, Danthrus said in a low moan. I've collected dozens of different stories about the boulder. In fact, I've heard that Halsa Gam put it there, that the Dragon Riders put it there, and that it was Matahook many times. Though some of the latter instead said that it was all that was left of one of the dragons who banished Halsic Gam and turned to stone by that wizard rather than Matahook. They got to the intersection of Albin Way and Central Way, the latter bisected the neighborhood, and before Danthrus, Torrin, and Afra could turn off down that road, Salvet, who had to continue on Albin Way, said, Wait, before you go, what's the story you heard, Lieutenant? Torrin smiled and shared Diaf's tale of Kyle's lowering, losing fight against a dragon. Why does everyone insist that there be a dragon in the story? It was one of the great beasts, it's obvious. Salvet sighed. Ugh, best go see what Sergeant Shitbrain wants. Danthrus smiled. I will never tire of that nickname. And that's chapter two. To read the rest of the book, you should support the book on Kickstarter. Um, thank you very much, and take care.